you know, uh, really uh, loved being at the conference, but I hate missing church. It feels like I've been gone for ages, and I was able to listen to Pastor Jimmy's message. He didn't talk about the sweet corn coming in this time, but uh, loved, uh, yeah, lo- uh, loved his, what is it, Alabama accent last time he's with us. Keep working hard. Someday the sweet corn going to come in. But, uh, man, was I blessed by listening to his message and just that, you know, let's, let's get after it. Let's share the gospel. Let's reach out to this world. And so, so it, it was very blessed and so glad that, you know, things went well. But I miss just being here, and I wish uh, I had been here listening to that message with you guys. But it's so good to, uh, Pat, it's good to see you, sister. This is 2013. It's a new year, and we're starting it off together in church. We're doing it right. <laughs> and, and it's just so good to see everybody and uh, sisters and brothers. And we're, all of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're one family. It's going to be one family for eternity. And right now, sometimes the journey is difficult. But uh, we're, we're praying and we're reading our Bibles and we're getting together and we're encouraging one another and uh, just love it. That's what Christ intended. He died to establish the church. And it's so good to know that there's hundreds of thousands of churches across the globe on Sunday getting together and worshiping. And, and you know what? We're doing it too. We're doing our little part here. Well, as I said, the, uh, can I have my mic just slightly down? Uh, as I said, the uh, Faith Walkers Conference is going to be about 30 bucks. Uh, it'll be a little less than that per person for a couple and, and much less for children. But there, as I said in the Sunday school class, there are not words that I could use to express strongly enough. Stephen said it's life-changing. I've used the term transformational. Uh, in, you know what? I'm not worried. Sometimes you, you go to a conference and you have a mountaintop experience and you come back and it goes... You know, everybody's so worried about mountaintop experiences. Mountaintop experiences are not bad. Go have them. They're fun. Uh, And here's the deal. You come to service on Sunday. Sometimes that's kind of a mountaintop experience. You read your Bible. You pray. You go to a conference. Collectively, yes, you don't always live on the mountaintop. Collectively, uh, uh, collectively they have an accumulated effect. on your life. All, all these things, all this investment, when we invest in the things of God, it pays off spiritual dividends. So I encourage you, we have GCLIs, Great Commission Leadership Institute. You can go on Saturday evening, uh, usually they're in Illinois for us because it's those are regionals. Uh, Saturday evening, get a hotel room, come back all day Saturday. What we've often done as a church is just head down on Saturday. We miss the awesome Saturday evening, but we save a lot of money. Uh, which is good. Friday evening, right. Uh, and then Saturday is the all-day conference. Thank you. Uh, then in July, I think, midsummer anyways, there's the uh, P&L conference, pastors and leaders. Uh, anybody who wants to go to that, start saving your money. You will be blessed. You will enjoy it. Uh, and then the big one, Faith Walkers, is, is usually several thousand people the week after Christmas. Make it part of your Christmas present to your family. You just will not go and, and come back not being blessed. You're not going to go and, and regret the time that you spent there. And, again, it's an investment in your life, in the life of your family, if you have a family, and uh, really want to strongly encourage people. Let's, let's just do it and, and, and go. And if you can't drive with everybody else, that's fine. But if we want a road trip together, that's wonderful. Uh, we got Torin here today. Torrance today with us for the first time. Yeah. Torrin is starting off the year correctly. He's in church. And uh, I want to pray for Torrin and, and all the children in our church. And in that uh, we can just really, really do our best to raise these children to love Jesus and, and just to be blessings to them. Let's pray for our kids. Can you join with me now? Just go to before God and pray for the kids. Dear Lord God, this is the first service of a brand new year, Lord, and we just want to hold our children up to you, God. We love these kids. We love them so much, and we know that you love them even more than we do. We know that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die 
uh, for our sins. And, and Lord, that gives us hope because we know how much you love us. And we know that Jesus Christ just didn't die on the cross, but he rose again. And Father, we sometimes it's scary to think about this world and all the horrible things that happen to people in this world, Father. And Father, it's so good to know that you're there and that you care. And that, Father, when we come to faith in you, heaven's waiting for us. Lord God, I want to pray for Torin and all the little kids at our church, all the big kids at our church. God, I want to pray for every single one of us, Father, that none of us misses out on heaven, that all of us will commit ourselves to you to be Christians, to live uh, Christian lives, to follow after you, God, to, to follow you as Lord and Master and King of our lives. Father, help us to build strong Christian families that follow you and love you. God, help us to be really good at love and patience and forgiveness and kindness and mercy and all the things that you call us to be. Father, we ask for your blessing on all the little children here this morning. Not your blessing on our church service. We pray this in your name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. First Timothy chapter one verse five says the goal of our instruction. That's that's pretty good. So next question is what is the goal of our instruction? You know, why do we have uh, why did the apostles preach what they uh, taught? Why do we get together on Sundays? Why do we do all this? The goal of our instruction is to love from a pure heart in a good conscience and a sincere faith. About the middle of last summer, I really started praying because I had, I had uh, reached a point where I was experiencing some weariness in, in my walk and uh, a little bit of discouragement, and what God taught me, and what I've been praying ever since, is uh, God, I just want to love people. I want to really care, because God, you know my heart. It's hard. It can be callous. I can do a lot of complaining, but much less so when I'm really trying to care for people, really trying to love people. So God, help me to love people. And then as a Christian, we always pray for God, I want to be good. And there's so much nastiness in my heart and so many bad attitudes there. Lord, I just want to be a good person. And I realized a long time ago that I don't have much time for cool people, but I really enjoy being around good people, nice people. Uh, God, I want to be a, a good person. And, and the words Bible uses for goodness are like righteousness and, and holiness. And sometimes those sound so spiritual and so big, but... We're talking about goodness. There's bad and there's good, and boy, I, I, I want to be good. <laughs> but one thing that the conference really drove home, by the way, today's message is 2013, a new year, and uh, just preparing ourselves for our, our study of the New Testament coming up. One thing the conference really drove home is this idea of encouragement, taking courage, is uh, have courage. Pray for courage desire to be courageous because life beats us up because there's a uh, the, the enemy Satan wants to to ruin everything our own hearts work against us sometimes we find ourselves feeling sorry for ourselves and, and pouting and complaining take courage so the things I'm praying for in my life uh, maybe it's going to be a different list for you but I, I really want to love and it says love and from a pure heart and a good conscience. So, yeah, I want to be a good person. And a sincere faith. I want to have a bold faith. I want to be courageous. Sincere. So uh, the goal of our instruction is, is very practical. So it's 2013. We make New Year's resolutions sometimes. We're here. We're at the church. Uh, How is 2013 going to be different than last year? Do I want it to be different? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, 2012 was great, but boy, I want me to be different. I, I, I want to keep growing. I want to, there's so many things in my life. You know, 
God's standard is perfection. I don't measure up to God's standard. Boy, I don't measure up to Dan's standard. The man I want to be, the person I, I would like to be, falling short of that standard, let alone God's standard. The goal of our instruction, the Bible says, is very, very practical. And uh, <clears throat> Christianity is a faith that works itself out in day-to-day -day life. Christianity is not about conferences and church services. I mean, that's part of it. Uh, but Christianity is the day-to-day -day grind. How well do we do go through the day after day? How well do we live out our faith on, you know, while well, you're going to work? How well do we get a, live out our faith when we're late for school? How well do we live out our faith when our neighbors trimmed our hedge and they cut out whatever? whatever? Uh, how well do we live out our faith when, boy, my husband is just majorly irritating. Or my wife is just, it seems like she goes out of, how well are we living out our faith? Not when you're at church and you just took a shower and you look pretty. How well are we walking with the Spirit day in and day out? Because Christianity <clears throat> is not <clears throat> about external things. It's about what's going on in our heart. Going, what's about going on right here? Spiritual maturity is not even marked by what we know. Spiritual maturity is marked by our character. Brothers and sisters, I want to be a man of character. Do we want to be people of character? Sisters? Yeah, I'm seeing some heads nod. Good. Men? Amen. Uh, spiritual maturity is not marked by how much we know, although it's important to know, because if we're going to have character like God, we have to know about God. So it, knowledge is important, but knowledge by itself doesn't get us there. Uh, sp true spirituality is about our character, which actually makes me uncomfortable, because I know myself. I once heard a pastor say, bad company corrupts. That's why I try not to spend too much time alone. Uh, it makes me uncomfortable, but it doesn't make me any less hungry to be good. In fact, the more I see how far I fall short of God's beauty, the more beautiful he looks and the closer I want to get to God. Because there is goodness. I don't need to lie to myself and, and, and boast about the goodness inside of me. How, dece how deceptive that is. I see goodness in God, and that's why I keep moving closer. And it's irresistible, and I, I feel the pull of his goodness, and I say, I want to leave behind all the encumberments. I want to leave behind all the things that slow me down because I can have a pain-in-the-butt attitude. I can be a nasty person. But why? Why? And I can do the woe is me as good as anybody. Never got me anywhere. It's very tempting, though. It's kind of a comfort zone. You're good at feeling sorry for yourself, so it's kind of a comfortable place to be. But, but it's not a wise place to be. It's not a happy place to be. And it's not a faithful place to be. It's a faithless place to be. So yeah, life is hard. Work is hard. Relationships are difficult. What's new? <laughs> But God is still good, and God's still calling. And when I hear that call, I want to answer, yes, Lord, I'm coming. Galatians 5, and 26, very famous passage, explains to us what Christian maturity is going to look like. Because you can sometimes see in, in uh, different religious traditions around the world, the, the guru, the mystic, the very mature person, very austere very serious, often looks like he's really irritated with everybody all the time. And we can get an impression that maybe that's what Christian spirituality looks like, Christian spirituality. I'm going to get a lot of information so that I can look down at all the other little people. And no, that is not what growing close, close to Christ looks like. Galatians 5, and 26. Listen to this. The fruit of the Spirit... In other words, you grow an apple tree, you get apples. And when we're growing in the Spirit, 
we get spiritual fruit in our lives. So brothers and sisters, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Let me just ask myself, Dan, am I a loving person? Am I a joyful person? Do I have peace in my heart? How is this expressing itself to the people around? When people look at me, are they seeing love, joy, and peace? Well, not always. Not always. Well, that means I have more places to grow. The fruit of the Spirit, those who are walking close to Jesus, have love. The closer we get to God, the more unconditional that love gets. They have joy. Dan, I want to challenge you in 2013. It's okay to experience some joy in the Lord. Peace. Well, peace takes faith, doesn't it? It takes courage. How about this? Kindness. There is no person who is spiritually mature who is not a kind person. Kindness is a hallmark of what a Christian walking with the Holy Spirit looks like. Goodness. What you like when nobody's looking? What you like when you're alone? Faithfulness. What's, what's faithfulness? Well, it's the opposite of faithless. Gentleness. Self-control. Oh, uh, I thought we were just supposed to let go and let God. Well, one of the guys at the conference said, if self-control isn't something that we're supposed to practice, then uh, the New Testament is written wrong. Self-control, we're called to do it. self control. That doesn't save us. We're saved by grace. Everybody tracking? Nobody nobody think we're saved by doing good because that's a lie from the pit of hell. The reason is because if I think, listen, please listen, this is the most important thing I'll say today. If I think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person, what am I doing? I'm elevating myself, which is pride. Because I'm saying, look at me. I'm good enough to go. And I'm simultaneously pulling down God. Because in the Bible, God is so holy and righteous that we could never approach him, that our, the, the, the gap between us is infinite. But as soon as I start to entertain ideas, wait, if I go to church and give money and I'm, I'm good enough, then I could go to heaven. What we're doing is lowering God's standard, which is the most wicked thing of all to do. Brothers and sisters, We have no hope apart from the cross of Jesus Christ. The salvation, the free gift of grace of a loving God. Those who belong to Christ, verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ, uh, let me finish. Self-control, against such things there is no law, verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We live by the Spirit. So... Let us also walk by the Spirit. Isn't that an interesting verse? I'm saved by the Spirit. It's not works, but my spirit, my Christian life, if you don't know this, you're not trying. It is so easy to be out of step with the Holy Spirit, isn't it? In our lives. And boy, does that result in internal messiness. <laughs> if we live by the Spirit, now therefore... Let us walk by the Spirit. That's a choice on our part to be in fellowship or, or not. Uh, let us not be, I, I think the Lord is calling. Uh, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another, because in the church, guess what? It's not just on football teams where you can have a little ego. We, we got that in the church. I mean, we have that in families. And the Bible says, hey, guys, let's not go there. Remember the apostles were always arguing among them, amongst themselves who is the greatest? I think that's mentioned three times in Scripture. Who's the greatest? Isn't that ridiculous? If I was Christ, I'd feel like, boy, I've been, I've been discipling these guys three years, and they're not getting it. But, of course, Christ had faith and strength, and he kept going. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Now, I want you to notice, spiritual maturity for, for myself, for yourself, For our church in 2013, 
spirit, because that's, that's the goal here is very practical. Our goal is to, to love God and to love other people. And, and, and all these things go into that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What's not on the list? Popularity. Popularity. In the United States, large churches, over 2,000, growing very quickly. Small churches, under 50, growing. Uh, churches in between 50 and 2,000 are sinking like a rock. We're in a danger zone. If everybody comes, we're, we're under 100 still, but we're creeping up close. Popularity, though, is not on the list. Being well-liked. Everybody wants to be liked. Being well-liked is not on the list. Fame, not on the list. Having a successful, i.e., large business or church, not on the list. Riches. Well, riches are nice. It's not on the list. Look at how God has blessed that person. They must be spiritually mature. No, not necessarily. Al Capone was rich. <laughs> doesn't translate to spiritual maturity. Lots of information about a particular topic like Star Trek or the Bible. Even lots of information about the Bible. Knowledge, the Bible tells us knowledge without love makes you like a puffer fish. You just puff up. Knowledge without love makes us difficult people makes me proud. This is the point of uh, Chris Martin at Faith Walkers East. I've been, we went to Faith Walkers Midwest, but I've been listening to some of the East ones on the, on the internet. How about good looks or a winning personality? And now Aaron Williams saying, oh, getting too close for comfort. Now, Aaron, those are perfectly fine, uh, but they don't automatically translate into spiritual maturity. Uh, but it doesn't, I mean, don't try to be ugly and have a really nasty personality. That's not spiritual maturity either. Uh, these things are not necessarily any of these proof that we're walking with God. These things are all external. What we see in the Galatians list are marks of people who are growing up and growing close to God. By the way, we're going to have uh, communion today. Second time in less than two weeks that we're going to be celebrating communion. And that's an act of faith. And if you weren't at the Christmas communion celebration, <clears throat> at our church, communion is open to everybody. You don't have to be a member of our church. Anybody who wants to say, I stand with Christ, I stand with God's people, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that on the cross, Jesus Christ laid down his life for me, that he bled his blood for me. If that's you, then join us today for, for a communion supper. We're going to be celebrating together. Okay, growing up, Ephesians 4.15 says, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is head, even Christ. Uh, we've got all these cute little babies, uh, Torin, Gabriel, Nehemiah. All, I mean, we just, we've got a, a plethora of cute babies in our, in our church. And, uh, and you know what? It, Chie just turned 13 last week, and Iko just turned... Big voice, 11. I'm glad I didn't say 10. Yeah, well, that, you know what that is? That's Papa trying to put on the brakes because it's happening so fast. And it's sad. There's a sadness when our kids keep going older, keep getting bigger because we enjoyed them when they were small. But Megu, we're enjoying them when they're big too. And uh, you know what would really be sad? is if they just stayed in place. And there's, there's, we live in a fallen world and hard things happen and sometimes children are born and they can't mature. And that's sad. That breaks a parent's heart. Well, brothers and sisters, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible calls us babies, baby Christians. Well, time doesn't help you grow up. You can be a baby Christian for 20, 30 years. These things, growing up and growing close, Speak the truth in love. We're to grow up in what? All aspects, the Bible says. Every part of our character. 
He's supposed to be growing more and more like Jesus Christ. Growing close. Remember what we saw at Christmas? Remember at Christmas we always say, you know, talk about Jesus as Emmanuel. Emmanuel is God with us. And we're supposed to grow close to him even as he's reaching out to us. And James 4, 8 through 10 says, draw near to God. Grow close. And he will draw near to you. And, and there's this phrase we've used before that Jesus is my rabbi and I want to walk so close behind him that the dust from his sandals kicks up on me. Or I want to be so close to Christ that I can feel his breath on my fa face. I don't want, a, I don't want a, a paper's width between me and God. Well, what drives us away from God? Selfishness, hard-headedness, self-righteousness. I mean, all the sins, right? All these things can keep us away from really being as close to God as we should. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. James was not being politically correct or, or a softy. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Oh, yeah, got to clean up again. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded. That means wanting to put it in the offering and wanting to keep it. That means wanting to be at church Sunday morning and wanting to go. You know, all these different things. Double-minded. Here's, here's, you know, I just used two obvious examples. Here's the most obvious example. When you are raring to go and you're ticked off at somebody and you want to let them have it. And you just want to, and the Holy Spirit's saying, boy, watch yourself. I'll talk to you later. I'll confess later. The most common I think we all experience is when our attitude is getting out of control towards another human being. And we know God is telling us, don't go there. Double-minded. When we're torn within ourselves, we've got, we've got our nasty side and we've got the side that God's making beautiful. And they're, they're at war. And the Bible says, don't be double-minded. Just don't go over there. It's got nothing for you. Nothing good. No reason. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. I'm going to put that on our sign outside. <laughs> Come to Foundation Church. Be miserable and mourn and weep. James 4, verse 9. <laughs> Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Well, what is... Heck is the Bible saying there? Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. There's a way to go through this life trying to cover up the pain and the brokenness inside with a lot of superficial laughter, with a lot of, you got to fight for your right to party. You just, there's a lot of ways to go through. You did not expect to hear that at church this morning. There and we go through life pretending that there's no pain inside. We, like, like we're not sinners, like the world's not broken, like everything's not mixed up. And we just pretend. The Bible says, get real. Your sin, Jesus Christ died for it. One of the, one of the pastors said, uh, Face Walkers East, he said, uh, think, you know, a sin, in, in sin that you struggle with. Do, did Jesus Christ do that? <laughs> no. Jesus died for that. Jesus died for every lustful thought. Every time we vent and let our anger just pour out on people. Every time we're greedy. Every time we're self-righteous. As if we ever could be. To be a Christian... You need to fall down on your knees and grab a hold of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're saying we don't have any righteousness in ourselves. We're not right. We're wrong. So Christians, let us not be self-righteous. All these sins keep us from God. And the Bible says, be miserable. Mourn your sin. Brothers and sisters, this is a serious question. When's the last time you ever mourned because nasty heart, nasty attitude. I'm not talking about wallowing. We're not called to wallow. In fact, that would be sinful. If you're going to wallow, wallow in grace. But when's the last time you let your sin just break you? And you said, man, why did I just say that to my husband? Why did I say that to my wife? 
boy, the thoughts going in my mind are totally ungodly, totally unchristian. And, and let that remind us once again how good the Savior is. Oh, Jesus, you died for that. You weren't ashamed of me. You embraced me. And you said, I'll take care of that for you. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. When we're broken before God, he puts his arms around us, he lifts us up. But if we start walking around and look at me, I'm Johnny Bible, thinking we're so wonderful, well, then I don't want to do that. Because <laughs> then the God of the universe is going to say, Dan, I think you need to be humble. And that's going to hurt rather be on my knees so he doesn't need to knock me down. And we learn to love the things God loves. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, sounds like legalism. No, it doesn't. Not unless you don't love God. Oh, it's just a bunch of list of things I have to do. Yeah. Like you love your wife, I have to talk to my wife. I have to give her a kiss. I have to spend time with her. I have to eat with her. Yeah, 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 you have to. But if you loved her, it wouldn't feel like legalism. And when we love God, we say, God, your ways are good. Your ways are better than my ways. And that's why I want to follow you. And so, yeah, I do want to obey you. And that's not legalistic. Because I love him and I love his ways. And so my confession is a lot of the time I'm not loving Christ the way I should. And that is just crazy. In, in sin is what is contrary to the will of God. Sin is telling God, and imagine doing this. I'm 6'1", a little over 6'1", on a little tiny planet, insignificant in the size of the universe. There's a trillion stars, there's a trillion suns in the Milky Way galaxy. You know, our, our sun looks so huge, we're 96 million miles away. That sun is just one of one trillion in the average size galaxy. And guess what? You know how the galaxy spins and all these little dots of light are all suns? There's a trillion galaxies. And I'm on just one little pinprick of a planet that's orbiting one insignificant star. And I turn around and say to God, you know, no thanks. I think I'm going to do life my way. Does that make sense to anybody? Sin is that which is contrary to the will of God. God says, don't do that, don't go there, it's going to be bad for you. And I say, no, <sighs> I've been around 20 years, God. I, I've, been around, I've been around 60 years, God. I think I know by now what's best for me. Well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to say that to God. That would be unwise. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Sin, again, that which is contrary to the will of God. You know what sin does? Go back to that list. That list in Galatians. Love, you know sin, selfishness, self-righteousness? Sin will break love. There would never be a broken friendship ever if not for sin. Joy, sin is a joy sucker. Sin will take all the joy out of our life. Peace, no. When I'm walking in sin, there's no peace. Patience, forget about it. Kindness, no. Sin is cruel. Goodness, no, obviously. Faithfulness, no. Faithlessness, yes. Gentleness, self-control, no. In other words, think about everything good in a relationship. Sin will take it away. Sin will rob you of everything good in your life. The wages of sin is death. Wages, when you work, you get paid for it. When we sin, we get paid for that too, and it's death. Death of love, death of peace, death of joy, and ultimately, spiritual death, eternal separation from God, because God is everything good. And when we choose to say, God, I'm going to walk away from you, by definition, we're walking away from goodness. But, but, the free gift of God, because he's good, because he loves us, the gift is eternal life. 
eternal life. Oh, that's okay. That's pretty good. Eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John 1, 9-10, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and His word is not in us. Christ would not have died if we weren't sinful, if we could have measured up on our own. Psalm 51, 17, The sacrifices of God our broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise them. And a humble, contrite brokenness in our souls is the right way to respond to our sin. Tom Short, uh, sometimes you see him in the Faith Walkers Journal, uh, campus minister. He's spoken at so many campuses to thousands and thousands of people. He's gone to India and spoken to thousands of people there. Uh, at Faith Walkers East, he pointed out that Jesus said, Blessed are those who are spiritually poor. Those who acknowledge their own spiritual poverty are blessed. So how do we make 2013 a year of growing up and growing close? Well, we need to be serious about it. So I want to just ask you, you don't have to raise your hand, but in your heart, are you serious about your faith in Jesus Christ? On one level, I can answer that for you because... I see you here this morning in our church. For a small church, we have spectacular attendance. Most people are here most Sundays. Most people are here every Sunday. So yeah, are we serious about it? Now I want to ask, ask ourselves, what do we really believe about all of these things we've been talking about today? What do we really believe about them? Because the direction of my life and your life and the direction of our church in 2013 will reflect our core beliefs. What I believe will express itself in my life. How do I think about myself? I'm a son of God. Jesus Christ died for me. He loved me. He's got a plan for me. He's got a purpose for me. He will never leave me. Do I believe that about myself? How do I think about other people? Do I, do I catch myself saying, those people or those people in that country are, are people that look like that? Do I allow myself to think badly of people of different racial groups or who came from different parts of town or people who dress differently? Jesus Christ died for that person. He loves that person. What right do I have to do? To, what right do I think? Who do I think I am to look down on somebody made in the image of God who Jesus Christ died for? Shame on me. How do I think about myself? How do I think about others? How do I really think about God? <coughs> you ever feel like God's ripping you off? God's not fair to me. God's just taking a dump on me. Well, I can tell you a little bit about yourself. When you do that, you're miserable. It's not magic. What's that? Not ESP. Is that ESP? Yeah. It's not ESP. It's just spiritual truth. It's a spiritual law. When you feel ill-used, you're capable of anything. Everybody's treating me poorly, so I can do whatever I want to them. Well, you're not happy. You're miserable. This person treated me that way, therefore I can vent all over them. Well, yeah, you have the right to be unhappy and miserable. Choose unhappiness. Who wants to be miserable in 2013? Then allow yourself to be bitter. Allow yourself to pout, to feel ill-used, to think that God is ripping you off. And I'll tell you something else. Not only are you miserable, you're a really, really difficult person to be around. Now, we still love you. And I hope you still love me when I'm walking in that idiocy. But boy, why, why do I want to be a pain to you guys? And why would you want to be a pain to the rest of us? Don't walk around feeling ill-used and miserable like as if you think God of the universe singled you out for special dumpage. Uh, do I believe that Jesus died to pay for my sins? My sin, sin, all those wicked, vile things I've thought and said and done, the way I treated people poorly, and Jesus Christ died for that. Do I believe that my weight of all this guilt and nastiness, and Christ said, let me take that off your shoulders. And if I really believe that, am I going to feel like God's not being fair? God's ill. 
Do I believe that Jesus died to pay my sins? That, do I believe that God is unfair because he's going to give me heaven and I don't deserve it? That's not fair. I'll take it. God, thank you for grace. That he sees all my sin. He still says, Dan, come, come to me, my son. You're my child. I love you. Yeah, you did something right there. I'm proud of you. Yeah, you see, you kind of tripped up a little bit, but I'm proud of you. Do we really believe that God is cheering us on, that God cares, that God loves? And God says, I'll forgive it all, and I'll give you a new life, and I'm going to give you purpose. And as an added benefit, you get heaven too, and that's not so bad. If I believe that, I'm going to have gratitude and, and joy and peace. Do I believe that all people are made in the image of God? I touched on this earlier. What Genesis teaches about is that we're all descended from, from, from Adam. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve in the whole world. So don't look at people that other racial groups or look differently than you or different cultures and think they're less human or they're below you. The Bible says people are made in the image of God. So when you're denigrating somebody because they look different than you or dress different than you, what are you doing? You're looking down at the image of God that still resides within them. Do we believe that Jesus died for the sins of all people with the Gospels teaches? If so, we're going to learn to love and forgive other people. Not because they're so wonderful, but because God's wonderful and he loved and forgave me, even though I'm messed up. So I'm going to, I'm going to work on this loving and forgiving thing. I'm so glad God said, I'm not going to forgive that guy. We say that, don't we? Well, that's because we got little tiny love, and he got great big love. Well, I want to be more like him. On Christmas Day, we had a wonderful, kind of low-key, uh, peaceful service here. We celebrated the Lord's Supper, had candlelight service, uh, sang Silent Night. We're going to do uh, Lord's Supper again in a moment. But first, I want to give a warning. One of the speakers gave stats that we've heard before, stats about the future of our country, that faith in Christ is on a rapid decline here in the United States. And he, he had about a third of the people stand up. And he said, now turn around and wave goodbye. And it, we, I think some of us thought the, those third people are going to be gone. He said, if stats for the Christian church help with, uh, hold up in this group, that third will be the third that stays. The other two-thirds, goodbye. The vast majority of young people who go to youth groups and go to church, go off to college and come back and never join church, never are participating in church again. Faith in Christ in the United States is on a rapid decline. Yesterday, the Janesville Gazette had an editorial. Did anybody see that? The Janesville Gazette? That at least in the last five years alone, the number of Americans who say they have no religious affiliation has increased from 15 to 20 percent in five years. And it's like something gaining hill, a momentum going downhill. From 15 percent to 20 percent in five years, this rough number is unbelievable. I don't need my rest of my notes. The number of people who go to church on a given weekend of, as of 2004. If, if you ask Americans what their, uh, how often they attend church, 40% uh, of Americans say they go to church. So 60% are being honest and saying they're not going to church. But another researcher decided, I'm going to look at it differently. I'm going to look at denominations. I'm going to look at individual churches and track their attendance. And it was a huge study over many years. And he found out that in 2004, and it's been consistent, about 17% of people go to church on a given Sunday. So we have now 20% uh, of Americans who say they have no religious affiliation. They're called the nuns. Uh, we have more people. 
you know, obviously not going anywhere, saying they're not going anywhere, than the 17% who are in church on a given Sunday. So the warning here is that if you just kind of relax and go to church when you feel like it, what happens? Well, the average American will tell you what happens. That you're lost. You leave and you're gone. And why is that? There's always a lot of different reasons for why we get out of uh, walking with the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we don't want to be of those who stop meeting together, who stop putting Christ first in our life. Christ is calling us to something better. And, and together, what we're going to do is as the darkness gets darker, we're going to love more. And we're going to say, this is a place that believes in joy and peace. This is a place that believes that sin can be forgiven. This is a place that that uh, is trying to heal broken hearts, that we want to build strong Christian families, that we want to raise up children that aren't leaving church, but they're going out and planting churches. And boy, I, I don't want to put an impossible goal before us. I'd like to see us plant another church in the next 10 years, and we'll have two churches. I would love to see that happen. And I'm not going to be you know, real mystical about this and say it was a visionary thing. That's just a, a goal. Wouldn't that be good? And I think once you get the first one going, you reach a certain size, it'll be easier to start other churches after that. But I would love to see that. First 10 years, coming up on first 10 years, spectacular. I, it's, it's just so good to be here. And, and if the Lord tarries, I'd like to ask him, God, please, we want to we wanna, we wanna start another congregation. We want to start another church. Uh, who knows? Could be Edgerton. Could be south side of Janesville or, or Fourth Ward in Janesville or... or uh, I mean, just a number of different places we could go with that, Milton. Uh, but just love to see another church uh, planted. And to do that, we're going to have to raise up more leadership. We're going to have to uh, get more people involved in a worship team, all these different things. And so let's be praying about that and focusing on that. And so are we going to be the people who just kind of drift? Are we going to say, God, here we are. We're, we want to be tools in your hands. Use us. We want to be front line. Lord, if you're going to reach Janesville, can you, can you work through us? Uh, too many people. Too many people sleepwalking into hell. And, and God's brought us together to do something about that. Well, uh, let's pray for those things I talked about earlier. Uh, love goodness and courage and then I need uh, not Bill because he's he's uh, maybe uh, Dan and, and Jerry to come up and help me with communion after we pray so everybody's welcome to take a communion uh, anybody who wants to say I'm, I'm gonna take of the bread and, and drink of the juice of the body of Jesus Christ to say that I know he died for my sins I'm accepting this forgiveness and I'm staying with God's people so that'll be open to everybody let's pray your Lord God uh, thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much for all my sisters and brothers here. Father, uh, right now we're coming before you and we're saying thank you for the cross. Thank you for paying for our sins. So we don't have to pretend we're so good. We can, we can confess our sins because you're faithful and you're good and you will forgive our sins. And God, we can just be honest with ourselves and honest with you and just embrace your goodness and embrace the cross, Lord God. And Father, I pray that you will teach us to be loving people who really don't we're not always filled up with ourselves, Lord God, but we're learning to just put you first. We want to love you with our actions, with our deeds. Father, that we want to truly be loving and caring and compassionate for the people around us. That people don't feel judged by us, they feel loved. And God, please give me and give our church and everyone in our church a ton of courage to get out there and start sharing our faith. And to stand up and not, not follow the world and not to be ashamed of our Savior Jesus Christ, Lord. Give us courage, Lord, to live Christian lives, come what may. And now, Lord, we ask that you would bless our celebration of the Lord's Supper. That we would remember that your Son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross, suffered for our sins. And that if we take him into our lives, that all of our sins are forgiven. Every single sin. There's not a sin that you don't forgive, Lord. And that, Father, that we are washed clean of our sin by the blood that he bled for us. That his goodness covers us, Lord. And you look down from heaven and you see his goodness and not our sins, Lord God. Father, help us to accept this free gift, your grace, Father. And help us to truly, willfully 
desire to grow up in our faith and grow closer to you in 2013. We pray this together. Amen. Dan? Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.